Hello and welcome. I'm back uh, and annoy you just again with uh, interesting facts about documentation. And um, this is basically uh, because first I don't want to give the talk at all, but then Victor convinced me that it was really important. So basically, uh, these are my findings in, uh, the, um, in the training documentation because uh, for the last eight weeks before this conference, basically, we were preparing the trainings, and so we found out lots of interesting and funny or less funny stuff about documentation. And, um, well, this talk is about how we improve that and uh, what we find and why uh, even we can see the reason why people did stuff, how they did it. These are maybe not the uh, best solutions to uh, work on documentation, and uh, we will uh, explain that. So, well, first, uh, about me, I am. I do that because everyone seems to do that. I'm working with Plone since uh, 2006. I do documentation for Plone and other projects since 2012, and I'm kind of involved in uh, different communities who have to do with uh, documentation. That is mainly write the docs, API the docs, and test the docs. That are basically three communities who are doing lots of different things with documentation, how why documentation is important for your company, how we test tools, how we teach developers to write on documentation and, and stuff like that. And um, it's really important. I really like to complain. Most of the time it's not me personal and most of the time my communication is not really good, but I maybe it's because I'm German, but I really, really like to, com uh, to complain. And then this is basically, oh, it's a bit small, a picture from three weeks ago from the Write the Docs documentation in Prague. And if people don't know actually what it is, Write the Docs is a series of conferences and meetups focused on all things related to software documentation and uh, technical writing. And uh, Test the Docs, so this is uh, output from CI integration. It's a spin-off, basically, of Write the Docs, and it's a really small community. It's at the moment something like 10 people. And uh, we have basically the theme uh, Write Drunk, Edit Sober, and uh, Test Automated, because we like automat auto automated testing of documentation. And uh, we do lots of tooling to make testing possible, but also make our life easier for better tooling for writing documentation. And uh, well, let me start with this disclaimer. This talk is not limited to Plone. I mean, we will use examples from Plone, but you can also basically translate them to, um, to Drupal, WordPress, your private software products, stuff like that. This talk is also not from the developer point of view, because I'm not a developer, so I do DevOps stuff, st stuff or um, documentation stuff, so this is more from uh, our normal user, let's say, sees documentation and experience documentation. And there is so much to talk on, I can talk the whole day, but we only cover a small list of uh, things with some interesting issues. And this talk is heavily opinionated. So some thing I may say, it's possible that you don't like that. And some people may recognize their own commits. I'm, it's possible. It's not personal, meant you're still awesome, but I needed some uh, examples. And first, we start with something positive. I want to uh, thank uh, to Fulvio and uh, Thomas, because for the training docs, for example, the pull requests about the theming documentation, they were really great. It was a place to uh, review. It was easy, fast, f following style guides and stuff like that. If everyone should do that like that all the time, we had the best documentation ever. So, thank you. And uh, now let's, uh, I like to, to, to get into know my audience. So, let's get an overview. Let's do a poll. Who actually here is writing documentation before they start coding? Raise your hands. Hey, some people, that's nice. Who has all the documentation included in the release process of their product? So, 
Oh, some people, even better. And who does quality insurance of the documentation before they release it? Well, some, some, there's hope. So, overview, let's see about what we talk. We will cover really short why a documentation is important. This is really, really short because I told that already multiple times on multiple conferences. Then we will see some funky, and funky as meaning as not that really great examples of our existing documentation and how people did stuff there. And later on we will talk about uh, reasons why this was maybe not the best idea and we will also uh, find out about uh, solutions. And also one other really important part is we will talk about the sexy fact of documentation. Documentation can be user appealing, it's really important. Later on we have some things about tips, tricks and tooling to make your life and my life easier basically. And of course the famous last words. So let's start with the uh, importance of documentation. Why is documentation important? One thing that's really important basically is uh, because it's important for the success of your software product. You can have a great product, but if your documentation is not there at all or really, really bad, most of the time your users are not happy because they're not able to find stuff. They are annoyed, then they're calling up your help desk or sending open tickets in your help desk and uh, that's not nice and basically that means your user is not satisfied with uh, your product. And this is especially for some developers. I'm really sorry, but documentation is in this day part of your marketing and product branding. It also will help you to do marketing and product branding. That meaning you can make money actually with it. So sometimes it's worth to spend this extra time to have nice documentation. And if you have good documentation, it will also save you money because you write now code, after five months later you may not remember why you wrote it like that. So it's not only saving your money because you remember stuff and you can look up faster stuff, but also for example, you are less busy with answering user questions about things in the user interface, what they cannot find or not understanding. or you hire a new developer and he has to, she, he has to get up to speed. So, hand over the documentation, pay, this is our workflow, this is our documentation. Way easier and way faster than sitting for five weeks next to this person and explaining all the stuff and then you find out, oh, oops, I can't remember why we're doing it like that. And this is my personal opinion, this of course also always depends on the product, but basically if you have no no docs for your product, your product is basically, at least in my opinion, broken. With that, I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to write always a book. Sometimes it's just, I mean, a uh, script can also be a product, but then you need at least some documentation, even if it's evil comments in the code, why you're doing that. I mean, it's also, like I said, depends on what is your product in this case. And let's start with a really funny tale of findings in different kinds of plum documentations. And then enjoy the nice, I try to use nice nature pictures to calm us all down because nature is important and quiet and peace are important. So let's talk some examples. We see the less good, the bad and the really ugly examples. And yeah, like I said, no offense, it's not me personal. So if you recognize your own comments, it's really not a personal thing. I still like you and hopefully you like me later. <laughs> so this is now special to, uh, to Plon, but you can easily translate that also to Markdown or if you use ASCII doc to uh, weird ASCII doc uh, syntax or whatever. Basically, what I try to say here, restock attacks so as other Markdown languages or markup languages, they have a syntax. And the syntax are there basically to Make sure you have later if you compile it to HTML or nice formatting and CSS is working and all the stuff. So it's like Python. You should know the code. You should know what you are writing. And you should use a syntax linter in your editor. This, for example, is a classical mistake. I think I fixed that something like more than 300 times in the training documentation. It's basically you have to pay attention about spaces and tabs. Otherwise, it will not work. And the same as uh, some people try to be really, really smart and uh, 
include dot rst, don't do that. I mean, it's, it's re it really comes down to if you write something and it doesn't matter in which language, follow the rules about the syntax and the language. It's like Python. In Python, you use pep8 or flake8 or something else. Do the same in your editor with, uh, with rst. And th this seems less important, but actually, this is one of the results why the training docs looked not that nice in the beginning, because people thought they did it right, but sorry, they did it wrong. And it took something like weeks to fix all the small stuff. So then links. Lots of time, I st still see that people use click here. I mean, I know it's really short. You mean click here on, on this word or button and then you get there. That is nice, but it's really bad for your user. It's way cooler if you say something like, check out our theming training, for example. Then the person who's reading the docs knows exactly where it will end up in the documentation. Way better, way better for SEO, by the way, also. Helps a lot. Your score, and yeah. Talk trees. Who doesn't know what talk trees are? Okay, let's explain that first. Basically, um, talk trees in, uh, in RST or Markdown, they create your table of content. And there are certain rules how you use talk trees. You can, in, in spins, for example, you can use them with numbering, uh, sort, follow with alphabet, um, stuff like that, or even hide them. But if you start writing documentation, you should settle on one style. Don't mix the styles. So here, for example, we have a result of uh, uh, two things. One thing is uh, we had uh, nested talk trees that mean you use in the main index of your whole documentation, so the starting file, basically. You use talk tree, and then later on in some sub, 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 sub document, you use again number it in talk tree, and then because how things build documentation, you get fancy, funny uh, results and how the ordering works. We had this for it really, really, it was really annoying to debug that. So don't do that. Think about from the beginning what kind of talk tree, what kind of table of contents, how I want to see it for the user, I if I follow the alphabet, do numbering. Really important. Then, this was the best one. Include. Include in, in, in documentation basically works like uh, include in programming. The meaning I can include in my part of the documentation. I'm writing here, for example, something about uh, theming. And then I need some stuff from JavaScript. Oh, they are writing documentation about JavaScript, so let's just include that piece because I'm lazy, I can include, meaning I don't have to write it myself. That's basically the idea. The idea is not bad, but it's tricky to do because you can do it, but then basically you have first to check the file which you want to include for different things like the tone of voice, how it is written, which kind of wording is used, does it actually meet my audience? For example, it can be that I do with my theming training is, uh, let's say, more for basic stuff or beginner, but I include a piece which is from JavaScript for hardcore JavaScript uh, wizards who are working since two years full-time with uh, patterns and React. And then you can have funny situations suddenly in your documentation for beginners. They are using words like, uh, I don't know, which are really sp specific for React patterns and you never ever explain that in your theming documentation because it's a theming for beginners. So, what I want to say is, if you use include, be really careful about tone of voice, file length, does it need more audience, is it written in the same style, do we use the same hidden types, do people understand it, or are there suddenly terminology or terms that I never used before, so all the stuff. So, it's bad. Most of, and the other important thing is, um, you depend later on on the docs. It's, Imagine half a year later, someone is changing the JavaScript documentation and this file, what you include, is moving. That will also mean your docs are breaking. So it's, you can use it, but I say it's not a good idea. 
Then Heatings. Heatings are also fun. Um, here we see a classical uh, header from uh, the solar training. It's not fixed. But can someone tell me what's wrong here? Besides the RST syntax, which is wrong too. Sorry? The yeah, that, that's the RST error. Really good. This is basically not a heading that's, that's a novel. That's a kind of a story. I'm telling everything in one line. And even if I can see the point why the person tried to do that like that, it will not help. And it's really annoying for the user because it looks horrible. But also, a header is there to give you a really short overview of what's now the next couple of events is coming. This is way too long. And if you, and you also use uh, headings in, in search, this will give you basically nothing, or at least not a good result in the search. So I'm really, really sorry. And besides that, like I already told, uh, the RST syntax is bad, so the builds will anyway fail. And the other thing is, you are mixing styles. If you do headings, we have to cover that later on, decide on one style. Meaning I use like the sentences, meaning I start with the capital letter, or every let first letter of my word is a capital letter. There are various ways, and there's nothing wrong or right. Everyone has a different opinion on that. I look, try to look that up, but Facebook is doing different from GitHub. GitHub is doing different from Google, and Microsoft is yet again doing it different, for example. And MailChimp has, I don't know, 50 sites about that. So yeah, there is no right or wrong, but if you decide to one style, stick to one style for the whole dogs. This one was another really good one. Can tell someone tell me why that is maybe not a good idea? No? Uh, it's, uh, yeah, basically there are a couple of things. First thing is uh, someone tried to use a uh, RST syntax for an RST command on a header because this Backslashes basically means in RST for things you uh, mark a command. Mm -hmm. And that is not good, but who is searching for a command in a header? So it would be better to just name it site actions and then second line say it's a command. This is, uh, uh, I'm really sorry to say that, but that's just type, typical developer stuff. I can see the point from the view of a developer, but for a normal user, that's not uh, the smartest way. And uh, okay, that's sadly a bit strong. But also, like I said before, my CI integration tells me this is wrong and will fail in red. I know it's hard to read. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah. But yeah, it's red, so it's broken. And yeah, no, we, we don't like that, sorry. Uh, and uh, talking to me, we got them in Bristol, the latest Bristol conference a couple of years ago. A uh, funny talk about documentation. There was all the top 10 of the most wrong written words. So you remember acquisition? It's still called acquisition. It's still the number one, but we have now from the training docs a number two as a word and not as another number two. And uh, this is uh, where we start talking about consistency. I found, and that's not all, that's only the, 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 the top list of how people write through the web, meaning TTV in the documentation. And this is, I'm really sorry that this is completely confusing for users. That's the reason why you have a style guide. First you define the, how you use it, and then you use it to the whole docs. But besides, yeah, we're using lots of different styles of writing, and some of them even with typos. So, not that handy, let's say, because it, it can lead to confusions for users, especially if you sometimes use them or even with underscores that can also mean, oh, it's certainly a command or what, what you mean. And I'm, let's tell me again, I will, this is how we do it in, uh, in Plone. This is how we decided to do it. This is in the style guide. Please just follow it and make my life easier, which also makes your life easier because I will less complain. And uh, the next one, PEP8 and friends. Who's using your PEP8 or Flake8 or whatever PEP Flake8 thing for your Python code? 
Oh, it's really cool, stick to it. Stick to it for please, but only for Python, not for documentation. Well, text or documentation in PEP8 makes no sense at all. I'm really sorry. I mean, if you can configure your editor for PEP8 for Python, you can also maybe hopefully are able to configure your editor for RST in this case. If you're not, ask me, I have examples for uh, Vim, Emacs, Nano, Atom, Sublime, Visual Code, whatever you use. And if I don't have them, I will create it for you. And this is from uh, the deployment training. And, uh, wait, can someone tell me why that is maybe not that handy or good? I, uh, I know that you can, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Thank you, thank you. This is really, really hard to read, even if you have to review it, and here even uh, there are also typos in it. Typos in it. it it's hard to read, it, it's hard to fix, it is hard to maintain, and it, it's really, really annoying hard to translate. So, stop using pep8 and friends for text files. And now we're going to the cool part, the way to uh, be happy minions for better uh, documentation. And the first thing that we do is we need to plan and we need structure. Never ever start writing documentation without thinking before what you actually want to do. So the first thing is, in my opinion, is uh, define your audience. You really have to know your audience. Is your audience a developer? Is it a beginner? Is it someone who never worked with computer before? Is it a designer? So adjust your documentation to your audience. It's really, really important. We still miss that in Plon. Then also make a list of the topic, topics in your training or in your certain documentation which you want to cover. You don't have to, or you do also you can't cover everything. Make a list, make a structure of points, and start with them. And also think about the order. It is better to think first about the order, then later write whole parts and then moving them around. Also terms. If you use, it's also coming back to audience and structure. Be clear and certain about your terms. Make sure you explain terms. If you use something like ZODB acquisition and all the stuff, make sure that you have a glossary where you link to and explain it. This is also going back to, uh, to audience. If you write documentation for a developer, she may know already what acquisition is, but if you use the word acquisition in theming docs for some reason, make sure you explain it. Also requirements. Tell from the beginning the requirements people need to install it, not, not hide it somewhere beneath. Make from the beginning clear from that we need, and you always can later extend information and documentation about other stuff. So in short, be really clear from the beginning. Address explicitly the audience. Talk to the audience. The other thing, give a short introduction in the beginning of the file, like the next, we will talk now, we will explain now a certain part of the thing or the content of this part of the documentation is. Because lots of time people scan over the files and they want to know in the beginning if that part interesting, if they include what they want or not. Uh, point. Also, this is really important because it's good for, for search engine optimization and stuff like that. And also, it makes your doc way more appealing for the user. Now we go to writing. Use active voice. You've, like I said before, use good headings. Short sentences. One line, one sentences, and one line usually around 120, 100 signs. Not too long. People don't read that. They want to read short sentences. If you search something, short sentences. Same with documents. Don't write documents with thousand lines. That brings us to the sexy factor. This is really demotivating for users. Try to keep your documents short and create more documents and be consistent with wording and terming. And yeah, create magic moments. All this is a sexy factor. If, the, if you do training, for example, write training documentation, don't write files like that. This is overwhelming for new users or anyway users. Make them short, make short chapters, and then in the end they have some kind of an aha moment and they are really happy that they achieved something and then moved on. Otherwise you will lose them in something like an hour or two. Then uh, active voice. 
make clear who is performing the action, and then there are some, uh, some examples what's uh, good for uh, active voice. It really, really, really makes a difference. I know active voice is, is hard. I also mess it up all the time, but it's way, way, way better. Uh, again, back to Hiddings. I already mentioned that at least two times. Hiddings are important because they're used in search and people look if this part now covering what I mean. So make them clear, short, and stand out that they're easy to scan. Style guide. I told in the beginning, use a style guide. Before actually I write something, I start with a style guide. Usually at Test Docs we have a style guide. So that adds also adds efficiency, for example, for reviewing, because you can have that automatically in CI integration. It, it uh, creates also consistency. It is good for your, identified, uh, for your branding of your company and, and stuff like that. So you really create a product and your name for yourself. And language. Language is important. Most of us are not native language speakers. And everyone has different educations, depending on culture, money, and where they came from. Have that in mind if you write documentation. Documentation should be, or training documentation should be understandable for all levels. So that's really, really important, especially if you're a native English speaker. They sometimes tend to forget that. What is, uh, so make them approachable. First thing, nothing avoids certain words. Like in the training documentation, I don't know how many times I removed just or easy. Of course, if you're writing the training and doing that for years, you know what you're doing, and for you everything is uh, it's super easy. I just start the build out, I just write this XML snippet or Python code, and then it's done. But this is for you. What for you is really is maybe for me really, really hard, and what you takes two minutes may take my something like two hours. So I avoid that word. It, it, it's not helping at all. It's really demotivating, because also it's unfriendly, because the user may think, oh, I'm less smart than other people. That is so annoying. Cliches. They are also not the best thing. Some people try to use them, oh. but they sometimes create the impression of laziness, or sometimes they are not carefully thrown through, and then they're actually insulting or offensive or hurting. And OK, that's hard to read. It's but examples are, for example, we are back on track, or yeah, you are dirty laundry. If you're native in speaker, that may be completely clear, but if you're not native, maybe it's not that clear, or in your culture, it means a completely different thing. Be careful with that. Don't use them at all. English Prime, this is another one that's really good, I like that. English Prime can really lead to confusions of people. If you're not native, for example, it's always that we are, right, the whole this thing. We are, or who's, it's not always clear for everyone. So be clear and straight with the language. And uh, weasel words. Who doesn't know what weasel words are? Okay. Weasel words are basically words which people use in, uh, in writing to add something. Like, uh, it is really, really that I mean that, or it's usually. So, weasel words are words or phrases used to avoid being forthright. Weasel words basically used when the speaker wants to make it seems like there's a clear answer, but I just add more words to look, make it look like more, even more important, or stuff like that. So, and uh, the list is really actually really long, that are only the most I have found that basically it's, it, it's really, like we had for example, it's really easy to do that. It, it's not really easy. And what is really easy? Or it, 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 it's very cool that I can install that. I mean, yeah, it's cool that you can install it, but yeah, what is very cool? I don't know. Uh, so avoid them. That's also hard, and I don't check strict on them, but try to avoid them too. And the other one is uh, dictatorship and discrimination. Um, if you write, please think about your wording. Uh, execute is not always that friendly. Also, obviously, or, or in order, they are also not the really nicest words to use. 
And I just read a, a talk even on this conference where people are still using master and slave. I mean, there are better words for that. Or this annoying thing with blacklist and whitelist. Uh, yes? Yes. On, on, on the other meaning, yes, on the whole sentences. And then I quote examples. Um, hmm? Yeah, that, that, that was a good one. Uh, yeah, you remember that better than me. So, and, uh, oh, I have to, so I have to hurry, my, my time is running out. Uh, code examples. We all like to use code examples in, in documentation. It's fine, but make sure they are valid, meaning they are valid in uh, your syntax language. In our case, that would be R structure text. Because if not, highlighting is not working, your breaks uh, falling and other stuff. And also make sure they are working. Some people just, uh, just copy some lines and they use that, but people tend to do copy and paste. And then they are wondering why the example is not working or breaking. If you, if you decide to only use a couple of lines, then make completely clear in a valid comment style for your language, uh, which uh, the code example is, like a hashtag or whatever, depends on your language, that this is not the full example. It says that to the people. And uh, we're starting now to even test the code exams, the documentation, Python examples against uh, Pepe and Flake it and all the stuff to make really sure that um, try to improve our situation of code examples. Um, which brings us to my law of the CI points, since I'm, since I'm kind of like CI integration. Um, basically, it's, we have some rules. The rules apply to documentation as to code. Do not break the build. If you broke the build, fix it. Don't commit your broken build. Don't merge a broken build. Books like code. We had now for the trainer a couple of times that uh, even the build was broken. They merged it and then with the comments in, uh, in GitHub, please fix it later because currently it's broken and giving me warnings. It's nice that you have this comment, but why you merge in the first place? If I dare to do that on, uh, on Plon Core, for example, I have to buy the next conference or sprint lots and lots of beer and apologize to lots and lots of people. The same does, does for do goes for documentation. Fix it first and then merge. And then, yeah, configure your editor. This is hard to read, but this is, uh, we have so a demo. This is basically my setup for, for writing RST. Like I said before, most of you have your editor configured for, for Python or for other languages or other stuff. And uh, you know, you can do the same for Markdown or RST. So please, please do that. It will, will help you a lot. This is, for example, I have lots of uh, linters for uh, for wording and then grammar, and I have spell check, and I have uh, automatically even it uh, builds me um, the file I'm working on in the CSS of Plone Docs org that I can actually see the file in the right CSS. And which brings on the next point: uh, tools to make your life and my life uh, easier and better. So tools and tips. First, we start with the editor. Use uh, linters. Use linter for us, T check. Use one for spell check. They are also grammar check, really important. And uh, for writing guidelines at all, you have grammar checks, but you have also like um, 
Hemingway, which is telling you that uh, if you replace that word with another word, it's better. You can do the same what we use on, on CI and use Veil. It's basically the style guide. I have my style guide hooked up in my editor. If I use a wrong term, basically, the style guide is checking already in my editor and telling me it's when you are wrong. And also, lens of four code examples, meaning for, for Plon, it may be easier because you already have your uh, editor set up for, for Plon, so, or Python, it will be help. And also, you can do HTML previews. If you think just uh, CSS preview is not enough, you can also have a shortcut in your editor to do checks with, uh, for example, a HTML test of HTML proofer which basically will check even if your HTML is valid and according to uh, HTML5 guidelines and stuff like that, which is really, really nice. And now we uh, move to uh, the demo time. How is that working? How can I swipe? Ha. Okay, this is uh, my editor. I use, uh, I'm sorry, I use Atom for writing, but this is also working for brackets, sublime, Wim, Emacs, uh, Visual Code, whatever fancy editor you like. And here, for example, uh, you can see I have my tree on open and I work on uh, Box.Plonorg asking for help. And then basically you see uh, my editor, you see uh, really, no, it's just, is that working? Yeah. If I click that, it's giving me all my, uh, my linters and it's telling me this is not good or few is not good and stuff like that. So I immediately now well, maybe I want to change that. But now I also want to see how that looks like basically in rendered HTML, because it's always interesting to know. Then I just can fire up uh, my add-in, which I, uh, the add-on I basically wrote yesterday. And this is giving me um, th only this document rendered in HTML with the CSS of uh, docs.plonorg, so I can see immediately from uh, looks, does it look like okay or not. So if I want to see more, I make it bigger. And this is actually kind of nice, at least for me, I like it because it helps a lot. And also it saves time because, I'm sorry, if you're still using Spings and every time you do make, sh make HTML, it will take a long time and it's really annoying because you only want to see this one file and not the whole documentation, right? And we go back. And uh, further with tooling, it's my new best friend, by the way. Content structure, yeah, create, use, work with personas, create personas, meaning I want to write theming documentation for a new developer. She never ever worked with Plone, what they have to take care of. You can also start with mind maps, create a mind map about exactly the, the, the order of stuff. Further on with tooling for writing. Use templates. Templates are really nice because you speed you up. I have RST templates for which giving me automatic the right uh, header style and description style, so I just have to fill it in. So uh, that saves me every time look uh, already a couple of minutes because uh, I have already the base structure of my document set up. The same with glossaries. We use at the moment a cookie cutter template. We're creating that. We'll rewrite it maybe to Mr. Bob, but it's really I uh, really try it. It's really really nice. Use intros, and also important, at the end of the file, use a recap and tell the people again, now we talked about that, the result is you should have learned that, blah, blah, blah. And for media, include media, this also again, sexy factor, make your certain docs appealing. Use pictures, use video if possible, use ASCII namers or animated GIFs. Or even drawings, doesn't matter. But if, if you have something that adds value to your documentation and breaks through this boring long text file, use it. And the most important tool in with what I like to call the human interface. Who knows what I mean with that? Okay, I thought so. Basically, you can do lots of stuff with automatic testing and linux and whatever. That meaning you have no typos, you have correct grammar and other stuff. But this will not help if the user is not understanding what you wrote at all. So with human interface, basically it means let real people test your documentation. The best is use a person who is supposed to be part of the audience 
and try the documentation where to speed up. And then uh, continuous integration, uh, since I'm involved in tested docs, we like continuous integration. We do all that, what I just mentioned, automatically in CI. So we do link check, page check, RST check, line length, file length, style guide check, top tree check, HTML validation, and image checks automatically in CI. So this is really, really helpful. The other thing is uh, karma testing. Karma testing means you write in a document, you make a pull request, we first check on only your pull request, and if your pull request displays the screen, you get the friendly greeter from, hey, cool, thanks for your contribution, and so on and so on. And the second test is running on the whole docs, and then you get a mail from, uh, we are really thankful for your contribution. Maybe you also want to change the other part, but nothing is more annoying and demotivating for users if you write on one small piece of the documentation, and this part is okay, but the test fails because someone else or somewhere else in the docs there's some broken stuff. That's what we call karma testing. And uh, yeah, in short, we yeah, plan and structure carefully, know your audience, use the right tools, and yeah, test, test, and again, test, and even test more. And uh, we have also some announcements. So 4th of December, we have the first conference for uh, API docs, that's a one-day conference about uh, writing and testing API documentation. It's in Amsterdam, it's really, really cool. And we will cover topics such as why is Swagger back and sucks on all levels from the documentarian point of view, not from the developer point of view, that's an important difference. And then we have the next year at, um, this is, uh, well, I will do it later, and then we have also in, uh, at Fostem next year in January, we have the first uh, test the docs unconf. We have a dev room at Fostem and we will have a whole day of uh, talking about testing documentation, tooling for documentation and uh, stuff like that. And uh, now I'm done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have? Do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, do you have any links uh, for the tools you are using, like uh, grammar checking and uh, whatever? Yes, I will uh, upload them and tweet that too, and link to all the blog posts and explanations and how tos and stuff like that. More questions? No. And thank you very much. And uh, just a reminder from my side, we will take a picture later after the next talk in front of the building at the stairs. So please make sure that you all uh, show up there. Thank you. <laughs>